So, thank you all for coming back uh, to this uh, plenary now. And please take a seat if you're not seated already, because I can imagine that you are very curious about what uh, all work groups have been doing for the last hour. So, I would like to, uh, like to, in to invite the person from the carrot and stick work group to report here. Thank you. Would you like a microphone? Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, we had a creative interactive workshop. And when you're creative, you always uh, uh, you produce colorful ideas. We started about having a sort of, we had four groups that sat, sat around tables, and at first they discussed what would be the task of a data steward. Well, as you already envisioned, that will be, there are lots of things they can do, and in some places they do, in other places that's a task of somebody else. But the main goal was to discuss amongst each other what they think would be a task. An important task of a data steward was going to convince others to do research data management. And then you have the usual stuff like, well, you have to do it, so please do it. Well, that doesn't always work. So we thought we're going to think of creative solutions to make people actually do research data management and like it. And uh, the carrot and stick is the title of my, you can use it, uh, make them, well, if you use a stick, they probably do it but don't like it. And the carrots, there's a bigger chance that they like it. But we, uh, we, we sat down in these groups and we had these wild ideas and, and they had to present their ideas in, in, uh, in a little bit more realistic idea at the end. And that's ending up this, this list. You can't read it, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, please, then I can read it myself. <laughs> and then we scored the ideas uh, with the little stickers. And then the, the, the best ones got a little prize. Um, the idea that didn't score much, but we, uh, was still very creative, was having a robot doing all the boring stuff of your research data management. But we all thought that needs a little bit more development because it's real, realistic. The other one was uh, play Euro millions. That means that all the, the funders throw their money in a big pile, and then we has, have a sort of a lotto, and then people get uh, gets by chance their uh, project funded. Well, there was already a bit more, more enthusiasm on, about that. But then we had three ideas that came very close. The one with 26 points, that was actually a very elaborate one. It started by a very enthusiastic pitch of the data stewards, like a TED talk. And then everybody was so enthusiastic that they re re were really willing to do it. And then they could score points. And the points they were turned into sort of donut. If you like your donut full, you, you get a, to a higher level. And they were so ambitious that at the end you could actually win a Nobel Prize. Yeah, it, they had to think out of the box, right? Uh, and the other two, one was the taking care of the researcher model, and that is actually a, a good approach. It is look, uh, talking to your researchers, asking what they want, try and pamper them so that they can actually do what they want and they feel, feel that you know them and then you help them and just pamper them. And the other one was uh, in Dutch the pub label model, well, uh, the, the porridge spoon model. That means you start with your first year students, you start t talking to them about research data man management, and you continue to talk them, to them about that throughout the whole career. So these are the options we came up with. Uh, well, there might be good ideas in there, but the take home message is actually think outside the box. Don't think of the regular solution, but think of something fun, something creative to get people do what you like them, want them to do and don't always follow the usual carrot and stick approaches, but make it fun. Now I would like to ask to come uh, forward the uh, reporter of uh, group two.
the data management and academic integrity. Uh, hi, everybody. So, uh, my name is Lotte Meelhorst, and we had an interactive workshop about the relationship between good data management and academic integrity, and uh, we had a really open discussion, so mainly um, I kind of summarized for myself a few of the issues that were raised. We haven't really worked towards a take-home message or one solution, uh, but just to share some of the thoughts and ideas. Um, uh, one of the things that was discussed was that when it comes to the way it is organized within institutions and uh, policy is developed, often, often um, research ethics and research integrity and data management um, seem to be two different worlds, whereas on the other hand, um, it's really straightforward for many people that uh, good data management contributes to research integrity, so one of the challenges might be to bring those worlds together and to see how policies and all the other efforts of people working on data management and research integrity can be combined. Um, um, and an issue that was brought up by many people was that what is really necessary is a culture change and awareness of all kinds of ethical and integrity questions when it comes to data management as part of research integrity, but also research integrity in a broad sense. Um, and how the challenge is also how to translate policies into action and how to support researchers best in their daily work. Um, we also had a discussion about uh, ethical committees and in particular about the scope of ethical committees. Um, because, for, for example, um, there are uh, medical ethical committees uh, and human research ethics committees, um, but um, the question was whether broadening the scope might be important to, uh, for example, also check whether research is ethically sound and method methodologically sound. Um, uh, and um, a final issue that was discussed was the drivers um, and incentives for researchers um, and um, for example it was mentioned that often money is a priority, uh, getting grants is a priority um, and that that has a huge effect on the way uh, the daily life of researchers uh, looks uh, and that uh, good research practices if that would be a priority over um, trying to get money, um, then uh, that could have a huge effect on basically the culture um, of researchers. Okay, thank you. You're going to be a duo? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so we, yeah, we, well, yeah, our slides are up. Sorry. So the three of us, uh, myself, Maria Cruz, uh, Shalini, and Yasmin, we run a workshop, an interactive session on uh, software reproducibility. Um, it doesn't work. Yes. So, um, so we, we were really fortunate. We had really good participants. Thank you so much, guys. It was, it was, uh, it, it was really like being back in engineering because it was just guys, just men. <laughs> so it really <laughs> reminded me of when. I mean, nothing wrong, but it reminded me. I, I did engineering, and it was really common to be the only, well, the only three girls in the room. But it was fun. <laughs> But we were also really fortunate that we really got a, a great balance. You know, we had researchers, we had research software engineers, we had data stewards and others. So we had actually the kind of uh, group we wanted to have. Uh, yeah, it was the, yeah, the session was on software, so we had a lot of people who actually develop software. Only one person said they had no experience whatsoever. Uh, and this is sort of, we covered a lot of, uh, well, we had the people from, uh, uh, you know, I think the, the full range of, of, of uh, research topics. 
uh, reproducibility crisis. Again, I think uh, the nature results are re replicated. <laughs> And, and then we asked, so through Mentimeter, we asked the participants what came to mind when we talk about software reproducibility. So we had a really nice, you know, this is the cloud produced. Uh, just, be, just before we had the workshop, and I think it shows that we had, like, people who are very knowledge on software. Uh, so what we did, we, we're, the software was inspired by a paper by uh, two professors here at Delft. I'm, Rolf, are you still here? Oh yeah, we were really fortunate to have uh, the main author of the paper, Rolf Hutt, who's a professor at uh, civil engineering here. And so wh what we discussed was, uh, you know, what I thought was really provocative was this idea that archiving and documenting code and software is not going to be enough to ensure reproducibility. Uh, so their uh, advice was to not just document, but use uh, modern so uh, computer science technologies like containers and open uh, and APIs, and also uh, ensure there's close collaboration with research software engineers, and we're really fortunate to have uh, actual research software engineers in the session. So we had uh, really lively and interesting discussions among the participants. Uh, oh, this were the, so the, the, uh, the group said to uh, address uh, these three questions and we used uh, Google Docs uh, for uh, the participants to take notes. This is, so at the end the groups were uh, asked to pitch uh, their main conclusions. This is what we wrote down as uh, they pitched. There's a lot here, uh, as you can see, but uh, this is a session that um, we're going to write it all up. We're going to produce uh, a blog post, write it all up. We are possibly submitting a, a paper to the IEEE eScience conference workshop on software sustainability. And we hope that uh, researchers, research software engineers, and data stewards can work together. This is just the beginning. Uh, so we can all work together uh, to address uh, this problem of reproducibility and in particular software reproducibility. I think, you know, software is such an important component of uh, contemporary research that there's not going to be reproducibility in science if there's no reproduce, if software is not reproducible, reproducible forget about it. Um, I don't need it. So, and now I would like to hear the report from the data management plan group. Good afternoon. Who of you has ever written a data management plan? It's actually quite a large group. Who of you have ever reviewed one or reviewed a draft? That's an even larger group. That's nice. Uh, my name is Marjan Grootveld. Um, this is my colleague Ellen Lehnerts. We both work at Dans, are involved in some of the European projects, uh, and support data management planning um, to an extent. And in this workshop, what is a, why is this a good data management plan? We had some samples from data management plans. Confidential, of course. Um, and in our preparation, we took two roles to be a relatively friendly reviewer and a picky reviewer. <laughs> it, that didn't come naturally to her. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, this is more or less what we tried in this session, although you may not have recognized it in the session. We had um, a good 10 samples from text from DMPs. And the question to the group was, is it a thumbs up text or a thumbs down text or undecided? Part of the undecision came from, I can only see this sample, and the DMP may have been huge. Fair comment. Um, but some texts were, even with that proviso, very bad. For instance, they were on the level of, when it is legally possible, it should be to an appropriate standard, so very vague and woolly. And there was consensus, I think, in the room. Um, other texts were mixed. 
um, for instance, there was some criticism about an answer to the data formats that would be delivered by that project. Um, okay, it's good that they say TXT and uh, RDF and so on. These are okay formats. But I don't know what I'm going to, what kind of content they will put into those file formats. That could be the negative part. The positive part for us also representing a long-term data archive is these are file formats that we no, we will be able to sustain in 20 years. So reviewing is both friendly and precise. Um, and the shares will be, slide, uh, will be shared, the slides will be shared, um, and we don't have a major conclusion for you. So. <laughs> well, except that there was quite a lot of consensus. So the, on the sample text that we showed, people were, most of the people who were in the room, which were still about 19 people, uh, said uh, most of them said oh yes we, uh, we we like this one or no we don't so I think that's a good point to take away that it's not just well if I was picky uh, I was not certainly not the only one so <laughs> Thank you. and now last but not least um, report from tagging privacy sen sensitive data Hi everyone, my name is uh, Ilona von Stein. I'm also working uh, at Dance. Uh, my session was fully booked because it's a very uh, timely subject. The GDPR comes into force tomorrow, so everybody was interested uh, to hear what's going on and I didn't have all the answers. Um, but what we did first uh, was warming up, also with the use of a Mentimeter. So I asked my group uh, how, what do you know about GDPR, but also how do you feel about GDPR? Uh, the interesting part was most people were a bit unsure how they should feel. One was very much in love with GDPR, <laughs> that was interesting. Uh, and the other one was actually very angry about GDPR. This was also nice to uh, discuss about. Um, what I then did uh, was elaborate a bit upon the legal framework of GDPR, um, set out some key definitions, uh, discuss the why and the what. Um, we went also then in, in some more detail uh, into GDPR when it relates to uh, data archiving uh, and also the derogations that there are for research data uh, when it comes to the uh, GDPR uh, personal data regime. Um, the next step was I presented a first prototype of a tool uh, that we developed uh, at Dance. And this tool is uh, actually a concrete tool. It's a decision tree-like tool uh, to evaluate whether data sets can be uh, shared uh, and under which conditions. So the, I can summarize it as the tool is interesting. It seems uh, lightweighted, but actually it's far more complex than the tool is uh, made at the moment. And of course it was very interesting to discuss with all the people about how can we improve it, what's your feedback, and I really got some, uh, gr some great feedback, both on the practical side. Uh, for example, we didn't have enough time uh, for all the groups, because we, I split it, uh, the whole group into four, and all group uh, are asked to keep a data set in mind and run this uh, data set uh, through the tool. But actually no group uh, managed uh, to come to a tag in the end. So it just took really a lot of time. There was still some confusion about key definitions and I really got some great uh, feedback uh, there. Um, but still, in the end, I think I can say that uh, it's the, the tool is useful to start at least thinking about sharing data, research data under the regime of GDPR. Um, so we had a nice session. Thanks. <laughs>